possible, never will be possible. And I said, the world has never lived in peace and probably never will. Now, Andy has another take on that, and he is in battle with me vociferously on several occasions about uh, peace. And he did say, hey, it takes a grassroots effort. No, it's not going to happen from dictators and authoritarians. And he said, we have to start on the, uh, on the ground floor. So our committee came up with an idea about hosting a forum. And we hope and pray that this will be the first of a series of meetings where we invite the public to come in and talk about topics uh, regarding peace. This is a very general topic. Is world peace possible? Later on, we hope to get into more specific ideas about it. But I do want to share with you the St. Charles New Day Rotary Club viewpoint on peace. Peace is not just the absence of conflict, but the prevalence of justice and opportunity for all. Though world leaders talk about peace, few promote the idea or the methods to initiate the process of discussion and action to achieve peace throughout the world. A grassroots effort is needed in order to promote and spread the idea of attaining peace. Peace is a major focus of Rotary International. The St. Charles Rotary Club seeks to initiate a process whereby we support the focus, provide for discussion, and promote the idea of world peace. And Andy and I uh, received a, a, uh, an email, or he did, and sent it to me, uh, from a local St. Louis citizen who wrote a paper on peace. Uh, his name is Dave Buck. And we were hoping he would be here tonight, but we'll hopefully meet him soon. And he wrote a 30-something page uh, summary of his plan for peace. And uh, a couple of statistics I pulled out of that plan. It's interesting. Our world is 4.5 billion years old. People have inhabited our world for 200,000 years. And of those 200,000 years, total peace has existed for approximately, anybody know? Yes? No, well, actually 268 years out of 200,000, we've had peace. Approximately 1,760 wars have been fought throughout human history, claiming more than 1 billion lives. The longest war lasted over 780 years. And of the nearly 1,800 wars, 123 wars have been religious or holy wars. Some really interesting statistics. But talking of peace, in a speech by John Kennedy in 1963, the president stated, and I quote, I am here to discuss a topic on which ignorance too often abounds and the truth is too rarely perceived, yet it is the most important topic on earth, world peace. How true. So I'll, I'll get out of the way here. I'm going to introduce our moderator for tonight, a gentleman who's a member of our club, Mr. John Clark, President and CEO of Master Clock here in St. Charles. John has been running the company for a number of years. He is a world traveler, and he has hosted and moderated events like this before. Uh, our club sponsors ethics panels, ethics panels over at Lindenwood University, and John does a wonderful job of moderating those events. And we're lucky to have him here tonight to do the same. And I'll let him get started with the introductions and get the uh, panelists to talk about their views and we can have a debate and some questions. So, John, I'll turn it over to you. Let's welcome John. Yeah, I'm John Clark, I'm President and CEO of Master Clock Incorporated. Uh, we manufacture very, very accurate time and frequency solutions right here in St. Charles, Missouri. We export it to over 110 countries around the world. Um, and if we can all agree on what time it is, we can work to each other. Uh, <laughs> also, here's the stat it is possible, which is not exactly statistically significant, but we have had peace. So at least we can say, yes, it is possible. It's possible. Yeah. Uh, so we do it again. Uh, what I wanted to do is just introduce all the panelists real quick. Uh, just say who you are, uh, you know, what you do, what you represent, and uh, why you chose to kind of be on this panel. Uh, so, Andy, we'll start with you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. I'm Andy McKeon. I, the reason I, I got involved with this is a couple of fold. I was a Peace Corps volunteer. I spent five years in Africa traveling across. I was a teacher, I was a coach, and I just loved Africa and I loved African people. But I, I didn't like the governments. I didn't like the corruption. I didn't like the fight. So I, 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 my friends used to beg me to bring them to America. 
so they have the opportunity that we have. And I came to realize it can't be just in America. We've got to be other places that have to have opportunity and hope to have a better life. One of the reasons I'm so focused on this is my brother's wife is Hungarian. She escaped to a minefield in 1956 when the Russian tanks invaded Budapest to squelch the Hungarian Revolution. My other brother's wife is from Seoul, South Korea, and her family escaped South Korea during the Korean War in the early 50s when North Koreans invaded the South. So we're talking about wars. We're homo sapiens means wise man. We should be able to figure out how wise men and women, women included in that, can really work together for peace. So that's kind of my impression. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Chelsea. Um, I'm from Chicago. I'm from Chicago. Um, so, yeah. My name is Fahima Bandali. I'm a sophomore at York City University. And my major is political science with a minor in international relations. And also, the fact that I'm here on this panel is because I was born and raised in Kabul, Afghanistan. And that really changed my career path and my interest about political science and all those political topics because I really believe that policies and what the government does is really on how to bring peace or to start a war. So, um, with the political science degree that I'm uh, right now working on, I really hope that I can go in policy. And also, uh, with my parents' experience, uh, experience with the Taliban takeover in the 1990s, uh, with that actually also shifted my perspective that it is really important to have peace and it is really crucial for a uh, country to be at peace because right now the experience that they have is horrible. And with that, it, right now the same thing is happening, which right now is really hoping that I can uh, do some positive impact in my society and also I can actually work hard to um, bring some positive impact to the world. It's a good start to here tonight. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Geoffrey Siente. I am the executive director of the Center for Africa. Uh, it's a nonprofit organization that works with immigrants and refugees. Here in St. Louis, I've been here a couple of times uh, in this room. Uh, but we help those immigrants who come from Africa or in the Caribbean area to settle and be able to navigate the American system when they come to this country. And most of them uh, relate to the conversation we're having tonight. It's because they are fleeing from the country where there is war, hoping when they come here, they can be able to have like, peace of mind and have peace, like we've put you all before. But also when they come here, they also have some challenges to go through. And that's why we come in to try to help them to be able to navigate the system. So for me, being here uh, and why I'm here is actually to see how we can be able to uh, have a conversation and share the, 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 the mind that peace is possible when it starts with us. Where we are, we can use influence who we are around with. And through that influence, we can be able to change the world. And that's this conversation today. Wow. Absolutely. Uh, and then last but not least, of course, uh, Governor Holden. Hey, thank you for inviting me to be a participant. Uh, as I said, I'm a former governor of Missouri. I serve now as the chairman of an organization called the United States Heartland China Association, which is 20 states uh, basically in the, in the heart of our country, not on. Yeah, we're always talking about the East Coast and West Coast, and I thought it's time we start talking about uh, our heartland region and how we build relationships uh, going forward. So I'm delighted to be with all of you this evening. I see that Larry Lifson is uh, listening in, and Larry's from Chicago and is a good friend. And so uh, more very excited to, to be a participant and listening to everything that's going on. Definitely, we're uh, definitely glad that you're uh, joining us, and we really appreciate it. Uh, the U.S. Heartland China Association, I've once had a chance to be on a panel for the Midwest U.S. Japan Association, um, and it's amazing how these regional blocks can really gather a little bit more attention than any of the states by themselves, um, which kind of goes back to the idea of cooperation. When we can all work along together, we can do more. Um, right. Back to kind of the focus of Rotary, um, what we all try to do. 
Um, so now that we've kind of met everyone, um, you know, the hope was we wanted to give each panelist uh, a little bit of a chance to go more in depth. So we're about five minutes to describe not just the service level of why you're here, but what brought you to that conclusion. Um, I think just to uh, kind of reverse the order, uh, Governor Holden, if you just want to talk, you know, real quick about an experience you've had that kind of drove you to some of the, uh, I guess, perspectives and conclusions you have, you know, what made you want to start the Heartland China Association? Is there a specific point where you realized this was kind of a pillar that's required for peace through well-governed commerce? Or what was it that really kind of drove you to prioritize this with your time? Well, af after I had left office, uh, I uh, was in St. Louis uh, teaching at Webster University. Uh, and I, I had been a chairman of the Midwest Governors Association it, while I was in the governor's office and was always thinking about uh, what could we do in the, in the heartland to rebuild our economy because everything seemed to be going to the East Coast and the West Coast and overseas. And so uh, I made my first trip to China and uh, was speaking to, to some students and the teacher came up to me and said, well, I understand that uh, your youngest son who's with you uh, turned uh, uh, 10, uh, could we give him a little gift? And of course, what's a father to, to say, but well, of course. And so one at a time, these students came up and uh, presented him with a little gift. And I turned to my wife and, and I said, I can work with these people. Uh, and so that's how I got started. And I've been active in the American Legion Missouri Boys State and Girls State program for over 40 years. And we set up a program a few years ago to send students from Boys State and Girls State to China for a week to learn more about uh, China and inviting students from China to come uh, and participate in our program. Uh, and we've done that. And a couple years ago, a young lady uh, got elected governor of Missouri Girls State and then they realized that she wasn't even an American citizen. She was from China. Uh, and all this tells me that if we can put the right people in place, we can figure out a way to, to make this work. And so uh, with what we're doing with the United States Heartland China Association is building those bridges of cooperation and partnering that are necessary not only for our country's survival and success, but also China and the rest of the world. And so we work at it day in and day out. Uh, we've uh, been uh, uh, pretty successful. Uh, but right now, as we're all watching the news, uh, we're in for some tough times. Uh, and uh, we couldn't uh, have a better chance of really thinking about how we develop world peace uh, tonight and going forward than uh, we are because of circumstances honestly beyond our control. But the key to the long-term survival of our culture and our humanity is we've got to find these bridges of cooperation. And the key to all of this is I think building those bridges so that people understand that uh, uh, failure like what is happening in Russia uh, is not a winning combination uh, going forward. Uh, and so if we build these bridges through the Rotary Organization, many other international clubs, everybody doing their part to lay a foundation so this, this can be successful. It can be done. It, it can be done, but you're not going to be successful if you try to put people up against the wall and, and tell them to, to cry uncle, uh, they've got to show that they've got to change how they do business. And that change can be more successful than what they've done in the past. And so that's what we're trying to do in our effort is to build those bridges. And we, we started about two years ago uh, with the idea. Uh, now we've got over 7,000 people from around the world that are participating in what, what we're doing. And what's fascinating about all of this is about a third of the people that participated in one of our programs come from the United States. A third come from our heartland region, our 20 states that I talked about, and a third come from China. So that gives us the opportunity to continue to build out. 
and that that's what we're doing. Uh, I really appreciate the Rotary Club and your effort because that is so extremely important uh, as we move forward because we've got to build these bridges of understanding and build relationships where they can see they can be more successful in a safer environment by making the changes that you're talking about and wanting to, to achieve than what we're seeing, watch it, seeing today in uh, Europe and Asia and Africa and other places around the world. Thank you for that. I, I think the key takeaway is when we talk about building those bridges, you know, you were able to point to a very specific incident where it involved your family and just a very caring kind of touching gesture, which shows that importance of realizing it's people. It's a humanistic thing. And we always talk about China this or Russia this, but within that single, you know, kind of frame, there's a lot of people behind it. And so that goes back to the Rotary Club. You know, I can, I've been to the Rotary Club of New Delhi, of Seoul, of Dubai, and I can walk in there as a Rotarian and immediately meet the people and know that we're like-minded. Um, I think it all comes back to that human-to-human -human connection and the empathy that you can only really get from connections like that. So uh, a lot of people are probably very thankful you were over there on your son's birthday. Uh, good timing to get all this going. Uh, that's fantastic. Do we have any uh, questions or comments about uh, on the home share with us tonight? Some of our experiences? I've never been to China. Who's done business here in China? Well, I had never been to China either, uh, but, I, but I saw our economy in our, our region of the United States was continuing to lose influence and uh, uh, finances, candidly. Uh, it was going to the East Coast and going overseas. And so when I, when I got involved in this early, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of people talking about China. Uh, and so I made the trip. Uh, you saw the, the experience that I, I mentioned earlier. And one of the other experiences I had as a teacher, uh, I'd always let my students uh, make comments after I turned in their grades so they didn't have to worry about uh, ticking me off. Uh, and this one young lady got up and, and said, I will not go back to China, the same person that came to America. Now, what better foreign policy can you have than building those type of relationships and, and those bridges of, of commonality? And so I think it behooves all of us to look at ways in each and every one of us can build those bridges of understanding with other people around the world. Uh, by doing that, then I think we have a real chance of making <laughs> Difference. Because as we're watching what goes on in the war now in, in uh, Russia, Ukraine, uh, this could very well uh, sp uh, spin out of control into a World War III. And that could be very, very, very dangerous uh, to all of us. And so it, uh, hopefully it's going to get everybody's attention so we can figure out how we can put that genie back in the model and set up parameters so everybody can feel like they can uh, be a participant and be successful. And those that try to break the rules and go outside the rules, uh, we can have me mechanisms in place to make sure that they can't break the rules. Yeah, you can't sell democracy as a concept unless you can show it's durable, scalable, um, you know, and, and dependable. Um, exactly. So I'll go to a we may not have global government, but we sure need some global governance. And I think that uh, comes through good ethics and performance. Uh, so we've got a question over here. Hi, Governor Holman. Uh, you mentioned the exchanges um, with your uh, with the Girls and Boys State, I think. Yes. Are you working with the Sister City program, partnering with them with the exchanges? It's, it's a dear love of mine, always has been. Uh, yes, we are. Uh, we're. We, we really work on two or three levels. Uh, one is building the personal relationships that you're talking about, uh, building also the business relationships and also the, uh, uh, the sister city, sister state programs, uh, you know, all, all the different connectors. Because the key to, to success, I think, is building those relationships where everybody sees there's a way for them to be successful, be winners, and they can win without trying to destroy somebody else. Thank you. Point, um, I happen to work with St. Charles Sister Cities, 
So if anybody wants to have a conversation about our local chapters, either during this event or after, uh, we can come in. Any other questions or thoughts for Governor Holt? No, th these relationships, these relationships can be built at every level. Uh, and I think we've all got to think about how do we open our mind and think about how, to, how can we develop win-win opportunities? Because if you build win-win opportunities, then you have a much be better chance for having peace. I just wanted to share that our experience um, with sister cities and exchanging, I had written a note to bring up the importance of hosting exchange students. And when you have someone from another country, in your home with, with Japan, we did it for two weeks when the boys first started coming, when this program first started. And I'm sorry to tell you, I'm thinking of maybe back in the 80s. Um, <laughs> but um, what an impact it made for my children. And then we went on to host other kids through ASS. There's quite a few programs out there. And one of the daughters um, actually married someone from New Zealand and is living there now. I get to go visit this summer, I'm so excited. But they also host people. And truly that experience, so throwing this out there to look into, and a lot of the programs just need someone for a week or two weeks, or even those that agree to host for a year, they still want an aunt and uncle family. So maybe one weekend a month. So that I just wanted to have you consider. Yeah, to, to show you how powerful uh, these building connections can be, uh, a few years ago, uh, a young lady got elected uh, governor of Missouri Girl State. And the uh, uh, people in charge found out that she wasn't even an American citizen. She was from China. But those 900 women picked her out of the 900 people that they thought would be the leader of their organization. So the key here is I think to start young and build those relationships and then help give the, these emerging leaders the tools and the assets they need to be the right type of leader going forward. Because uh, the, as long as we exist and we coexist, then those people have the opportunity to truly be the leaders uh, of our our world going forward. Very exciting things. Any other questions or comments? So we give Jeffrey a chance to share his testimony. All right, sounds good. Looks like I need to go visit Shanghai pretty soon, Governor Holden. We appreciate that. <laughs> uh, if anybody else has any other questions or comments, uh, feel free to uh, raise your hand as we go. Uh, Jeffrey, you want to talk a little bit about uh, a little bit more detail of not just what drove you to get involved with the organization, but some key turning point in your life where you realize this is the passion that I have to kind of highlight and follow. Yeah, sure. And I, I, I really agree with the Governor Holden because uh, um, I think when it comes to the what is, uh, I, I really want to emphasize the importance of building the bridges. And uh, when you talk about bridges, sometimes you always see it as a big thing that has to be done by the government. But I bring up, it goes back to what uh, she just mentioned about how being, being involved in AFS, being involved in the sister six program. Uh, and we, before we started meeting, we, we had a conversation about uh, American Peace Corps volunteers. And uh, every time I go and I meet somebody who has been out of the country uh, or maybe has volunteered out of the country, the conversation is always different because this person has exposed themselves to different culture. And they've learned a lot. They've made friends uh, across uh, different continents. And the perception about life and things is always different. And, and I, I share a good example is I went to, I normally take my kids sometimes to um, <coughs> different places around St. Louis area. So we went to the Arch. And then in the Arch, when you go in there, there's a small cubicle for five people. So we were three me and my two girls. And then the next person who was joining us was a father and a son. So we, we just sit here. You have to talk. 
<laughs> you, 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 you have to talk with this person, and I'm, I'm very good at starting conversation. And then when I'm talking, the guy was very quick. He said, you have an accent. I like when you tell me that. So that now we have a conversation to talk. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, yeah, I'm from Kenya. And the, judge, the guy just lighted up. And he said, oh, I love Kenyans. And I asked him, oh, have you been to Kenya? He said, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then they tell me about that. Oh, Kenya. He said, I work, I'm from Kansas. And I'm just here visiting. But I own a, a, a garage where we have I fix cars. And so there is this Kenyan guy. He comes, and I, he's one of my customers. And we come, we just talk, and we started, we just connected. And uh, every time he come, he bring me mandaji. Mandaji is the African donuts. <laughs> he brings some food. And then I just love Kenyan food. And I love Kenya. So I asked how many other Kenyans you know? He said, that's the only one I know. <laughs> and, and, and I say, I guess you love me too. <laughs> he said, of course, I love Kenyans. <laughs> so the conversation goes on that exposure that we had with the Kenyan and the conversation he interacted, he thinks Kenyans are like that guy. And I made sure I don't disappoint him. <laughs> <laughs> so we went up, we had all the time with the, with the son, because we had the time with my kids. And we all the time, we took pictures, and we came back the same cabin, coming down. But what I'm trying to say is that the exposure that people build up, and every time I'm thinking, I was thinking about that guy, every time we will read the news and hear something about Kenya, the first person who comes into his mind is his friend. And maybe myself when we met with <laughs> because I was maybe the second Kenyan. Or anybody he meets, not from not from Kenya, but from Africa, he would think about what is he talking about, my friend. When you're talking about hatred and all this stuff, the first person to come in is the person that you connected with. And I've always seen life like that. Every time I meet with people. And I get excited when I hear somebody when he's telling me it's been a peace cop for long I want to know where did you come from? And they'll tell me the experiences they had in, in Congo, the experiences in Zanzibar. So the conversation is always about the personal connection, the person you interact with. And if anything that somebody talks about it, you feel like you're really attacking a friend that I know. I've always said that building that, the way to build world peace, I would say, is being intentional and be able to get out of the stereotype and you have to connect at least with one person. You get one person, you make it two. You get another person, you make it three. If you have a way to travel, travel. Uh, don't believe too much on what you watch on the news. I will always say building that connection makes a big difference because if you are watching a movie, like there's a documentary that has been shooting, been shared that was done here in St. Louis about immigrants. It's called uh, one, uh, I can't remember the name, but it just seeing that documentary and you react, you hear the real story of an immigrant, the real story of a refugee. And, and now the story for the impact they're doing in this region, your perception about immigrants and refugees changes because you have had a story, a version of immigrants that you didn't know, or you have had a version of Africans war in whatever country it is in a different way than you had it before. So I think uh, my passion about building relationship and building those peace in the country, I've always said, how do I build peace with the people around me? And how do I influence that person that I meet every day to see me as a different person, to see me as one person who has, has some value to bring in, the, in their life or whatever it is. I think we have to be intentional to see things, not what you've been told, what the news tells you about, but going out and finding things for yourself, talking to people, interacting with people. When I'm here, I, I go to very I make sure that I have somebody that I can connect and possible have a phone where we can have a coffee. It could be a stranger, whatever it is, but I just want to know how good am I to be able to interact and make peace, a small world peace with the few people I interact with.
Very insightful. I still, my takeaway was donuts. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Ozzy, come on. Yeah. That's the right word. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so again, it just goes back to that person to person connection. It also reminds us, like, to a lot of people, you know, if, if you do go overseas, a lot of people will look at me and say, oh, well, you are an American and you are the American that I know. So I'm kind of representative of it. Um, I was, one thing that I think is interesting, we do a lot of trade shows and our uh, director of international sales, uh, Ramiro Benitez is from Ecuador uh, in his early 80s. And we'll go overseas and we'll be somewhere and they'll say, they'll point to me and say, well, you're an American. And they'll say, what about you? And I always kind of laugh. I'm like, you know, he's been an American longer than I have. <laughs> I kind of laugh and we also point out that he was an immigrant. He's an American by choice. I'm an American by chance. So who's more conscious and intentional? If that's what we're talking about for finding peace. Um, so yeah, just can't bring the stereotypes in and also remember you could be representing, you know, an entire people when you meet somebody. Uh, so no pressure. Uh, well. Any comments? Amazing when you got to learn, like you're talking about the cultures and uh, traditions and so forth. So, I was always excited about any chance I had to learn about people in another country that I may never see, and also to have them talk about their experience with Americans. And oh my gosh, we were kind of like all over the place because we have so many people who've immigrated here, and so they're tons of traditions in the United States as opposed to what you heard about in other countries. So it's so important to keep your eyes and ears open because you learn. We're all people, we're all moms and dads and brothers and sisters and so forth. We're, we're all actually the same. So if you get the opportunity to learn from their experiences and so forth, it, it makes the world feel smaller. I agree. Experience is the driver. I, I think I think what both of you are saying is exactly right. Is is the, the road to, to world peace is to be you know the best representation of who you are. Uh, and so yes, you you represent uh, Kenya and. The people from China, you know, represent uh, China, and myself as uh, someone who's Jewish, you know, I represent uh, the Jewish people, and so it's very important that you know that I I put my best foot forward because you know when someone thinks if they know that I'm Jewish, then that's how they're going to judge other uh, Jewish uh, people, um, and it's so true. So yes, we have to be great representations of whoever we are. Absolutely. Never saw a way. Well, thank you. <laughs> I like Jews <just> now. <laughs> thank you. I've never been to Kenya myself, but uh, look forward to uh, getting there someday. Absolutely. We 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 actually um um I. Well, I've always wanted to, and these are some of the young people that I work with. I've always believed that, uh, uh, like you mentioned, if you actually invest in these young people, I think their perception is different from maybe the way we think. And I think the exposure that we, they are given early, I think they, they are the people who will be able to bring the work piece that we are looking for. So we do have organized meeting forums that we take them to Africa. Last, Last year, they raised money here and they were able to build a school in, in, Af in Africa, start a school in a, in a place born in, in Kenya. And uh, ideally, when I, I take them there, yes, there's a community benefits, but the people who benefit more are the young people. Because when they go there, they see this in a different way, the perception of our life. And the things we take for granted when we're here is different. We see a lot of things we take it for granted. But when they go there, and they see them doing that small thing, how much it makes deeper it has on the life of those kids and maybe the generation to come because of the exposure to education. I believe 
that when they come back, they see things in a different way. And in the next 10, 20 years from now, uh, they will be people who are in the senior position, the, the governor, the, the, the senate, and the decision that they will be make will be based on what they have experienced over years. And there is no way that somebody will be making a very biased decision about or something that it will affect somebody when they have that connection. And, and I think that's what I really get excited when I hear about AFS program. Because last week, actually, I was, two weeks ago, we were actually at uh, Jonesboro High School. And they have a great program. Right now, they have two students from Africa. The reason why I was excited they have to share and go talk to them is because they're trying to build that big uh, diversity at the school. And they wanted us to go there and show African culture. And I could see the composition of and the excitement of some of the parents coming to know how to cook with Gali. Gali is the African food that we cook. And they were so excited to come then when we cook Mandazi, the donuts, <laughs> they, could, they, all, they all could not wait for her to stop to really cooking. <laughs> but I think when, 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 I, when it, we talk about peace, I've always said that you can't change the world for yourself, but you can change the world of one person. So how about if we all have that invitation of changing the world of one person, <coughs> one at a time, one at a time, and then over time, starting with this child, where we are, St. Peter's, where we are right now, and then somebody else, like Lions Club, is doing, having the presentation of every region where they are, and change the world one at a time. And if everyone adopts the Rotary philosophy, we're all too busy doing business and making money. We don't have time to fight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, Larry Lifson might have some ideas because he travels, uh, his job goes all over the world. Oh, well, thank you, Governor Holden. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I am really concerned with world peace. I have traveled to many countries. Um, I do believe as you do that building culture, uh, cultural understanding and exchange is really important. I guess my concern is that we just in America don't seem to be able to respect and get along and, and, you know, and, and, and um, treat each other with dignity and what we should be doing. And I think, you know, as they always say, if you, if you don't like yourself, how can you like others? I think it's an issue that we really have to face is, um, is how do we make this prevalent? I know I'm speaking in, in big pictures and, and maybe very vaguely, but, but I just think as, as human beings, we need to figure out why after thousands of years, we still can't figure it out. So I'm not giving any answers. I guess I'm giving questions, but, but that's really my concern. The last, you know, maybe five, six years have, Whereas I thought we were making great progress as a society, I have second thoughts about that. So I'm sorry to be negative, um, and I and I am optimistic. I'm a very optimistic person. I just want to say that, um, and I and I believe the work that all of us here are doing is helpful. But I think you know the purpose of this is how do we scale this? How how do we make it effective on a big level? So let me stop there. Those 200 some odd years we had of good peace when that was possible. <laughs> right. Thank you. Um, I, I think a good foundation is here in this room. And a good foundation is the fact of talking of bringing young people early. Uh, not old, and uh, it's too late for me, but I'll keep working. <laughs> and, uh, and then a sister city. My grandson, who is now 24, I took him to the Sister City, to Ludwigsburg, the St. Charles City um, uh, uh, family. And I tell you, he was 13 when he went there. And when we got to the, uh, to back to the airport coming home, his mother and father did not recognize him. He talked. He paid attention. There was eye contact. He, I, I mean, like, take your kids over to Europe. Uh, well, I'm telling you, they'll come back different. But the thing is, and it has helped him 
he is active active talk for hours because I'm certainly biased. But do starting young is the time to do it. And it's good people like in this world that keep it going, and then they will take it and keep it going later on. And I thank you for Rotary Club, which of which I'm a member. And um, I I think it's a wonderful uh, direction we're going. I, I was like uh, Dan, uh, President Dan. You know, I think until we started talking about this, I just didn't think it was going to be something that could be done. But I think it is doable. But oh, it sure ain't easy. Oh, yeah. And the hard part about it is it's not just something. Do because obviously we've done it for a couple of years now and all of a sudden we're in quite a tragedy so it's in the past to be continuously done. So I have had the privilege over the last few years of, of having pretty deep exposure with Rotary and some of the most profound experiences that you get to have when you're an incoming governor is a lot of international interaction and um, it's really been a fabulous experience. And I've also had the opportunity to travel extensively. But I agree a lot with what Jeff said. And I think it may be the cornerstone of Larry's solution that he's seeking. I think peace is about friend finding and friend building. And when we get to know one another, as Jeff expounded upon, it makes all the difference in the world. And I think tonight we're talking about world peace, which is drawing us into international uh, diversity. But there's a lot of diversity among us sitting right here in this room. And we can, um, one of the priorities of Rotary over this next few years is really helping people to appreciate one another. Whether you're male or female, black or white or yellow or pink, or you speak this language or that language, or you're urban or you're rural. I'm a farm wife. I know I, I really have to represent well, right? <laughs> uh, among other things. So there are just, you know, diversity is, is, is such a hot button for us. But really, um, as was mentioned, we, we all can find something that we have in common when our hearts are in the right place. So um, Andy called me uh, because he knew that I was going to have the opportunity to leave the district this next year. Um, in February, he said, hey, um, did you have you ever heard of the United Nations World Day of Peace? And I said, no, I have not. <laughs> and so he began to educate me. And then he talked to me about the initiatives of the United Nations in identifying one day in the world, September 21st, when um, ideally, it's the, the big picture idea um, is that there would be a ceasefire and there would be one day in the year when there would be no war in the whole world. In this district of Rotary, District 6060, we are going to invite our Rotaract clubs, our Interact Clubs, which are our high school-based Rotary service organizations. We're going to invite all of our clubs. We have 51 of them throughout this district to all consider a, a peace project that would happen on September 21st. And if Rose Cooper, who is leading this charge for us, who's a past district governor and a member of the Rotary Club of St. Louis, if we are successful in fostering a lot of energy around peace projects, which could be anti-bullying, it could be planting a tree, it could be things that bring people together in your community, um, we can get a lot of media attention. And Andy knew this because he thinks in big pictures and that tidal wave of insight and inspiration that can flow from our Rotary District from Hannibal to Cape, which is a really small part of, of Missouri, can actually begin to have the ripple um, that I think was originally imagined. And it's really just about each of us being peace builders and friend finders and building those better friendships, which is a part of the Rotary four-way test. So exciting things. Thank you so much for doing this to catalyze all of this kind of work. And just to follow up on that briefly, when you say friend finders, 
I work with international students and one of the most gratifying parts of what I do is when these students come over with preconceived notions about certain groups and then they find out that they're, you know, they're, they have those groups and their classmates, you know, as classmates are on the teams they play on and it changes them totally, right? They, they understand we're all human beings, we're all the same, we all have the same desires and wishes. And then ideally they go back to their country and, and you know, make the change viral. But it is, but your point of yes, making friends, whatever, I think can go a long way. Kind of the do your piece for peace campaign. I'm going to need to leave because I've got to take another phone call. So uh, thank you very, very much for participating. Larry, I'll be seeing you and good luck in all your work and all the rest of the people. Uh, uh, you're, you're involved in a good cause that desperately needs all of us involved. So thank you very, very much. Thank you, Governor Holden.
I'm not sure if you can hear us, but I think you're on mute and we cannot hear you. Can anybody hear me? We think that the speakers are on mute and we cannot hear you. Oh, okay. We <laughs> do Digitally. <laughs> <laughs> All right, how are we doing now? Yes, we can hear you now. Will they have to reconnect? Can't blame Ron for this one. <laughs> 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 All right, well, we hate to abandon our digital friends. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and provide those opportunities for the children, for the smaller children that goes to school every day. And, um, and again, the division between the schools, the divisions that the fact that a lot of those kids are not able to see someone who is different than them in their daily interactions or in their neighborhood, that is also a concerning topic. Because, uh, because yeah, a children growing up with something, it, uh, uh, actually one of uh, Webster's students did a research is that, um, that when children are more exposed to people who are different than them, more international people in more um, different countries, it actually makes them more empathetic. It makes them more understanding. And also, they found that, that they have good, better GPAs too if they are doing that. But that study was really fascinating. And that is one of the reasons that I chose Webster University. Because uh, Webster University is one of the top 2% 2, 2 for this study abroad. So we have so many students from different backgrounds, from different countries. So it actually forces me every day to talk to someone new. And the fact that my major is also international relations, it really helps me a lot to actually learn them. Um, I was talking to a Russian girl in Webster and I told them, do you hate American? And she was surprised by my questions because I always had this mentality that Russians hate Americans and they, and also Americans hate Russians. So when I asked that girl that question, she was really surprised and somewhat offended that why would you think that I hate Americans? Uh, and I just said, I don't know, that is how media introduced to me that a lot of, uh, a lot of Russian hates American. And she said, no, even when I was living in Russia, I had American sweatshirts, I had American uh, hats and everything. So, no, so that was a really surprising uh, information for me to find out that the fact that it is not, does that, it is not the same thing as I thought. So it actually presents the idea that the one story danger because um, a lot of social media they present you just one story about a country. For example, we have seen about stories about um, India that a lot of hunger or not a lot of poverty up there. So that single story is also dangerous because India is a beautiful country. It is a beautiful country. It has lots of different other cultures, and the fact that media only presents you with the fact that um, uh, that India is a whole country or India is uh, this kind of way, that is also dangerous. So, and also I super agree with the conversations that we had this evening that be intentional to go and talk to people because if you're not trying, then uh, I, that it makes it a lot more challenging for you to be more exposed to other people. Um, so yeah, I'm super grateful to have that opportunity to have different people who have different experiences, different backgrounds than me that I can have daily conversations with them. Um, but yes, uh, uh, and I would like to hear your questions and your comments about things so I can expand that. Two takeaways. Hey, don't be rushing. I should be about it. I forgot that when I Thank you for, for sharing all that. Right. It's kind of hard. Like, there's a nice image you can find when you search Delmar Divide. Um, there's an application where you can track where you jog and it can kind of you know, give you all that. And you can generate a heat map where you can see where users of the app are running. And it shows you a, a lighter color versus a darker color if more people are running on that route. And when you look down Del Mar, it's bright yellow. Everyone's running on Del Mar. And if you look south, it's extremely, you can see people running around all the time. And it is just pitch black if you go north. And it's, it's an extremely, extremely stark reminder what is the Del Mar divide. So when we, we sit here, as you said, we preach inclusivity, we preach diversity, and we do all of this, then you cannot escape that vision when you come here and you're confused. Um, how do you uh, practice with you a little bit? You know, I think you do uh, uh, a fundamental. Uh, that's very good point. All right. So I think, I think the point of uh, getting young people involved is a, is a great point. And uh, we're, uh, I guess as a fan, you were talking about how most of the wars in the world have actually been religious wars. Uh, and uh, so, what we need to do is we need to have you know interfaith groups uh, of young people uh, so that so that people know that even though they're different, they're still the same. And there was a, a group 
uh, back in uh, 2015, 2016. I don't think it's still, uh, it's still a, a group in Burma that's called Front of Peace. And it was actually uh, Muslim, Jewish, and Christian kids would uh, get together and uh, they would actually uh, learn about how their similarities or differences. And uh, as those kids grow, hopefully they'll learn that even though they're different, they're still the same. That's the other thing you say, hopefully. Hope's not a good strategy. You can give these kids across the borders and help them start eating each other's food. So I just have to mention, since you talked about it in the bay, um, connection. I was at the International Assembly, and one of the people in one of the groups that I was in was the, the person who is my counterpart in Israel. And there's one district in Israel, and his aspiration around building world peace and lifting up to the equity and inclusion is all, apparently all the Rotary Clubs in Israel are, are exclusively Jewish. And he said, you know, there are a lot of Palestinians who live in our neighborhoods. And so his effort is going to be to be intentional to invite Palestinians into Rotary and to have interfaith clubs. And I'm sitting there listening to this and I'm like, oh my God, talk about the world of peace initiative that's one person at a time inviting people into groups um, and beginning to build friendships because we share a country and we share a community. Uh, so so I, I, I anyway that was, that was a great idea. Kind of on that going on to the Rotary Club Community Club I went to was an all men's club. And there was one woman who was part of a club across town, and she was a visiting Rotarian every week. Thank you. I want to talk about young people. I totally agree. You have to get the young people, your grandchildren, your children, whoever, even the kids in the neighborhood, to uh, be respectful of each other. Um, but I had weird experience. It's been about four years ago. I was manager of a bank, of a bank and I was interviewing uh, for a position. And I always do the phone interviews first. Um, and I never look, I always look at the person and their, their personality first to see if they fit in and I might be able to call it. So this young girl was very easy on the phone um, and she was great. And I said, well, I have a face to face. And she said, well, I do have to tell you one thing about me. And she said, you may not want to meet me. And I'm like, are you okay? And I said, I don't think so. I said, what's the problem? I said, have you been in jail? Did you have been in jail? You have been in jail. You're all okay. I can tell her. And um, she said, no, I am. Um, and I probably could get the really wrong. She's part of um, uh, Letter to the Saints. I forget the name of it. And I said, okay. And what is the problem? Well, I've been on three interviews, and as soon as I said that I am, that was my religion, they told me they didn't want me to hire me. Wow. <laughs> and I, um, most of the people in my Rotary Club knows me. I'm very open. And I said, I'm not shy. <laughs> sorry. And um, I said, well, I'm sorry. I said, I still would interview you. And so then I'm thinking to myself, I don't think, I've never asked anybody what you're in. 